But beloved, over we have now uh, reached the fourth and final installment on our series of messages this Christmas time. And our theme was God with us. It certainly was a blessing to me, um, again, studying through the account and the narrative of the incarnation and the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And I trust that it was a blessing to you as well. Over the course of the three Sundays, we have looked at the moment of his coming out of Galatians chapter 4. The method of his coming from the Gospel of Luke, which we have read today. And then last Sunday, we pondered on the message of his coming out of Hebrews chapter 1. This morning being the last installment of the series, I'd like us to consider the man, the God-man who came. Open your Bibles, please, to that verse that Brother Branco has just read, Philippians chapter 2, and we'll start reading from verse 5 onwards. Isn't it amazing that the Lord interweaves um, our thoughts uh, in our morning reading and in prayer and our devotions. So today we'll uh, look at Philippians chapter 2. Would you stand with me please, if you're able? Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 5. Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 5. The Apostle Paul writes to the church in Philippi and says this, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross." Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every one, every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Let's pray together. Father, again we thank you. Lord, for the opportunity to proclaim your word. Thank you, dear God, that we have this place that you have provided for us. Thank you for the fellowship of the saints and those that are represented here today. And Lord, as our heads are bowed and our hearts in tune to you this morning, we seek the Holy Spirit as always. Uh, once again, we're uh, enthusiastic and uh, wanting to learn more from you today. I pray, Lord, that we would not quench the Holy Spirit, nor grieve him. Pray that we would uh, allow him to do his wonderful work in each of us today. Oh God, I pray that at this Christmas time, that you indeed will be in the very center and forefront of our thinking. Father, we remember those of our brethren that are not here. We think of the Christians, we think of uh, Brother John Ball. Father, I pray that you would um, uh, strengthen them, uh, you stay uh, close to them, encourage them today. Father, I pray that as uh, they uh, go through their aches and pains, that uh, you be even um, magnified in them. Uh, give them grace sufficient, O oh God, and that they would be reminded of your goodness to them. And then for our brother Francois, oh Lord, we commit him to you at this time. Lord, that you would undertake for him during these difficult moments. We especially pray for Caroline and the children. For many times, uh, those that are on the sidelines uh, suffer as much as the one that is lying on the bed. Father, for the ministry at Mauritius, that you would uh, protect the flock. Lord, that uh, the foxes and those that will uh, lead, try to lead them astray, that you'd keep them at bay at this time. 
Oh dear God, this man has rendered his life to you to serve you. And I pray, Father, that you will do your marvelous work into the hearts and lives. And that through this, again, Father, you would get the glory. So, Lord, in the meantime, as we ponder upon the God-man, the incarnate man, the Jesus Christ, our Savior, who came to this earth, Lord, I pray that uh, indeed he will be magnified. And so we ask all of these things now in the mighty name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Christmas is my favorite time of the year. Without apology, I believe it must be celebrated. And I believe as a church we should take every opportunity, every opportunity, beloved, to proclaim the incarnation of the Son. Every opportunity to preach it, to point people to Christ uh, during this time. Some may not agree with me, but I am actually for Christmas decorations, the emblems, the symbols that Christmas brings. But if you're going to ask me what is my favorite emblem, my favorite symbol, my favorite decoration, it's not the Christmas tree. I don't have an issue with it, as some people do. In fact, I enjoy looking at it. With its evergreen leaves, I see growth. I see life. I am reminded of that tree that will be in the new heaven and the new earth. This tree, beloved, bears 12 manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And its leaves were for the healing of the nations. In the Christmas lights, I see the one called the light of the world, which taketh away the sin of the world. And as those lights flicker, I am reminded that my life and how I live it should indeed be the salt and the light to this dark world. That's what I see when I see in the, when I gaze upon a Christmas tree. I see the blood of Jesus in the red baubles. I see his majesty, his grandeur, his glory in the golden baubles. I see royalty uh, in it. The red and white candy canes hanging on the branches. Again, I see on the red part of it, the red stripe, the blood of the lamb. And in the white part of this little candy, I see the purity and the sinless Christ, the Savior. Its shape reminds me of the hook that the good shepherd has. At the top of this tree, I see a star. Reminds me of the star of Bethlehem, where the baby Christ was born. And at the bottom of this tree, I see gifts. Makes me appreciate even more the precious gift that's God's gift to man. Oh, the gift of salvation by faith in the grace of God. That's what I see. Beloved, others may view a Christmas tree and perhaps they would see paganism and I, they are entitled to their view. But as I gaze upon this emblem, upon this Christmas tree, with all its trimmings, I can see Christ all over it. It's all about perspective and what you see and what you want to see. I don't worship the tree, but I can actually use the Christmas tree as an evangelistic tool because it reminds me of that precious one that hangeth on a tree. Depending on where we are on our box of preferences and opinions, as good as the Christmas tree is, it's really not my favorite emblem and my favorite symbol during Christmas time. So what is it, Pastor? It's this one. You're probably thinking it's out of place with all the decorations and I'm not knocking it. I'm thankful for the ladies who put an effort 
and all the things that you see before you. But I purposely left this little emblem on the last part of our series. This is my favorite symbol. But someone would say, well, that's not an accurate description of the incarnate Christ. He wasn't born in a, in a, in a wooden uh, manger. It's more likely uh, in a cave where all the animals are and, and, and on, a, on, a, on a manger that is a hewn out of a rock and certainly not made of a wooden uh, manger like what you have there. Let's stop there for a moment. Did you notice that in that little discourse, the focus was on whether it's made of wood or whether it's made of a rock? And we lose focus on the man that laid down on that manger. This is my issue all along for when we began the series. The Emmanuel, beloved, the God with us, with us. And for some reason, plenty of people in their millions today, believers and unbelievers alike, are focusing on every other thing. And we forget the God-man who came. And so, as we close this series, may we not forget our theme. This morning, I want us to be encouraged at least for the next few minutes. And I promise I won't keep you long. Let's not focus on the ham of the Christmas stable, but on the Son of Man born on a stable. Let's not focus on the stress that Christmas brings, but rather on the Savior that came on that first Christmas. For just for a few moments, beloved, just for a few moments, I beg you, let us not focus on the gifts, but the giver of the gifts. Instead, let us draw our attention, just like the angels and the shepherds, let us adore the baby Jesus on the crib, the makeshift crib. The hymn writer asked and subsequently answered his own question, what child is this? who laid to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping, whom angels greet with anthems sweet while shepherds watch are keeping. This, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds God and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him, Lord, the babe, son of Mary. What child is this? One radio commentator puts it this way, and I quote, some say that he was a good teacher. Some say he was only a good example. But examples don't hang around prostitutes, do they? They don't hang around drunks and dirty politicians. Others say that he was a religious madman. But madmen don't speak the kind of words he spoke. Clear, lucid, perceptive penetrating, nor do madmen uh, draw a, a women and children to themselves, or are they served by men with the intellect of Peter, the intellect of Paul and John and Luke. Some say he was a religious fake, perpetrating a hoax like every other would-be savior, but fakes have a way of staying dead. This one rose from the dead after three days. Others say he was only a phantom, but phantoms don't have flesh to crucify and blood to spill. And many have said he didn't exist at all. He's only a myth, but myths don't set the calendar of history. End of quote. And so what child is this? I agree with the commentator 100%. I agree with the wise man who saw the true king as a child. And I also believe Thomas got it right. After seeing our Savior with his nail-pierced hands, and he cannot but say, My Lord and my God. 
Thomas got it right. Some 78 times, beloved, in the Gospels, the Lord Jesus referred to himself as the Son of Man. Even some believe that this was his favorite title of himself, a title of humility, a title of submission, and an attitude that I pray that you and I would all have. Let this mind be in you, our text says, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but what? But made himself of no reputation. Took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Oh, there is so much theology in that little phrase. And time doesn't permit me to discourse uh, with you on that. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. This baby Jesus, beloved, again I say, he left his perfect heavenly abode uh, and, and in the company of the holy angels and allowed himself to be born in a putrid animal stable. He left the glories of heaven and came down to this fallen, degenerate earth in the company of sinful man. The one who is God came and became man. God, man. Do you see him? I don't mean seeing him on Christmas cards. I don't mean seeing him in the nativity sets all around us. But do you see him? The one who was prophesied, beloved. The one who fulfilled all of the prophecies about him. Can you imagine him as he coos and ahs, as he hungered and cried, as he moved his tiny little hands and feet, and as he sucked his tongue? He was a man. The other day we have Benjamin in our place. And I love it every time he comes. And of course, our little Cara. And of course, Clint and Bianca. <laughs> I have to say that, don't I? But as I was watching him, this little Benjamin, and oh, are they so different. Chalk and cheese, Branco, Cara, and Ben. But as he coos and as he asks, yes, Josiah. I took a break in my preparations, and I saw in that little boy the humanity that must have been demonstrated by the infant Jesus on that makeshift creed. Do you see him? Can you see this tiny little baby as he was wrapped in swaddling clothes only one day to die? To die for you and for me. Again I say he died so that you and I can live. His purpose was to be born and become the payment for sin through death. His death and no other. Not just an ordinary death, beloved. Not that any death is ordinary, but death on the cross. On the cross. Verse 8 our text tells us, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto the death, even the death of the cross. Christmas without the message of the cross is an incomplete message, I believe. Isaiah 53, 5, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Matthew 20, he gave his life a ransom for many. Romans 3, he became our propitiation for sin through faith in his blood. Romans 5, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us in that while. While we were yet sinners, Christ died.
for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Ephesians 5, Christ hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice. And how can we not mention 1 Peter 2.24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. The cross. Nominal Christianity don't normally focus on the cross until Easter time, but not us. Not at Calvary Baptist Church anyway. The cross is central. It should be front and center in the message of Christmas. Otherwise, it's an incomplete message. The cross and the crucifixion was the cruelest instrument of death known to man. It showed the depths of man's depravity, beloved, and his cruelty against his fellow man. The cross. The man crucified would be suspended between heaven and earth and awaited helplessly for his death. After a matter of hours and even for some, uh, uh, documents tell us, for some even days, the victim would so look forward to dying in order to relieve himself of excruciating pain and suffering unimaginable to you and to me. The cross. Let it not be absent in your Christmas celebration. Let it be the center and forefront of your discussions over the Christmas table. Beloved, I seriously doubt even if we are even capable of fully understanding the awfulness of the death on the cross. The creator crucified on the cross for his creation. Did you get that? The creator crucified on the cross for his creation. Creator on the cross. But you see, I don't have to fully understand. My Bible tells me that I have to trust what was accomplished on that cruel cross for me and for the rest of humanity. If you're trying to uh, explain it to the fullest, I'll pray for you, but I can't. And every time I look at that cruel cross, all I can see is my sinfulness. It was my sin that put him there. It was your sin that put him there. It wasn't his. It's ours collectively and the rest of humanity, beloved, that put the creator on the cross. The man, the God-man who came to this world, came to be born on a makeshift crib. He came to be crucified on the cross. But you see, the babe on a manger didn't stay a baby. I know in their millions today, religions are still worshiping a baby, Jesus. They've left him on the crib. And they would touch him and they would put some oil and they would uh, kind of rub this little hanky and rub it on themselves. Thinking that the baby Jesus this Christmas time would give them some special blessings. I see that and I used to practice that. But I see in the folly of that today. But as I recognize that, my heart melts because like I said people in their millions people close to our hearts are still practicing that today the man the God man came to this world came to be born in a makeshift crib and he came to be crucified on the cross this carpenter's son grew up to be a child. The Bible says, in favor with God and in favor with men. 
Then he suffered and died on the cross. But verse 9 of our text. This is what Brother Branko was saying this morning. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To what? The glory of God the Father. Here we find the God man in his crowning glory, beloved. God highly exalted him, given him a name above every name. That means uh, uh, everyone will confess him. Every man every woman, every child that ever was born and will be born will confess that name. And everything, every creature of God in heaven, in earth, and under the earth will worship that name one day. Every tongue would confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. My friend, there are people today and in times past in their squillion who would refuse to acknowledge the Lord Jesus. In their squillions, beloved, they would refuse to bow, refuse to confess that Jesus Christ, the Emmanuel, the God with us, they would refuse to consider him, acknowledge him as the Lord Jesus Christ. But there is a day coming, beloved. There is a day coming, whether they like it or not, they will confess him to be king of kings and lord of lords. And they will recognize his crown. It may not look like that, but everyone will recognize his crown. Perhaps you are here, though. And you have not confessed this Jesus. You have not confessed this Emmanuel. You have not recognized this God that is within us as your Lord and Savior. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. And shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. The Bible says thou shalt be saved. Beloved, this is the message today and Christmas time. This is the message on Easter time. And this is the message, at least from this pulpit, that will always be preached that you are a sinner. I am a sinner. And we cannot redeem ourselves. And it will only be the Lord Jesus Christ that can save us. That is the message. Of Christmas. And then verse 10 it says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And this same Bible that, that wrote that under inspiration, of course, this same Bible records that the Lord Jesus saying, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. Aren't you glad that the God man came? Aren't you glad that he was mindful of men? Would you confess this Jesus today? Would you acknowledge this Savior, this King, this Emmanuel, this God that is with us? And so in closing, may I say, perhaps you are here this morning and you're looking, you're searching. Perhaps you're looking and searching for the perfect church, the right religion. Well, may I please tell you that there is no perfect church, at least this side of heaven. And this church is no different. Many of you 
and I was reviewing the things that went on for 2017. Many who have uh, uh, entered and exited those doors have been complimentary of Calvary Baptist Church, and I praise God for that. But if you're here and you're looking for a perfect church, this is not the one. At our very best, beloved, we are all sinners saved by grace. Kept by the power of God. Led by the Holy Spirit. <coughs> led by Jesus Christ. Not led by Manny Malari or whoever. Led by the Lord Jesus Christ. We are what we are, beloved, just like the Apostle Paul said, because of the grace of God and nothing more. I thank you for your compliments. I thank you for your sweet words. But I want to channel all of that to the glory of the Savior, Jesus Christ. Because we have been redeemed and we have been adopted to his family we have been given a new nature, and that nature allows us to do what he wants us to do. And that, if that is the result of good teaching, of good fellowship of the saints, and good and caring discipleship of everyone, praise God and not praise anyone else. So if you're searching for a perfect church, may you find, may you find some church somewhere. But I can tell you, on the basis and the authority of God's word, you won't find it. Perhaps you're here, you're seeking for a religion. May I tell you, don't. Because if you're seeking for a religion, religion divides. Christianity unifies. You'll never find what you're looking for in religion. What you need to be looking for is a relationship in Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ. So if you're searching and you're looking for him right now, don't look for him in the crib. He's no longer there. Don't look for him at the cross. He's no longer there. Don't look for him at the tomb. For he has risen, beloved, exactly as he said. If you're looking for Jesus Christ and the right church and the right religion, look through his word. For in this word, the inspired word of God, you will see the Lord Ghost. You will see the word that was made flesh and dwelt among us. You will see him in his, all his glory and all his truth in this Bible that we have in our hands. Don't look for Jesus at the crib. Don't look for Jesus at the cross. Look heavenward. For he is now seated at the right hand majesty of God. Look for him in his word. Many beloved throughout history as we know it uh, saw the Christ prophetically and even personally. Uh, Deacon Stephen saw him standing at the right hand of God before he was stoned to death. The apostle Paul heard his voice thunder from heaven while on the Damascus road and again on the third heaven. The prophet Isaiah saw him sitting on his throne high and lifted up. The other prophet Daniel saw him reigning as the ancient of days. The psalmist saw him riding on the wings of the wind. And beloved, the apostle John, oh, the apostle John, in his old age, exiled at Patmos, saw many things revealed to him. And he was asked to come up and write and be the revelator. He heard and saw him say, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. The old apostles saw heaven open and saw Christ sitting on a white horse. On his head were many crowns, it says, clothed in a vesture dipped in his blood and written in his vesture, King <laughs> of kings and Lord of lords, is what he saw. The apostles saw and heard him say, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things. Then he said, I am the root the offspring of David and the bride 
and morning star. Oh, what a wonderful Savior we have. The God-man incarnate, the Emmanuel, the God with us, came as a babe on a makeshift crib, on a humble crib. And let's not debate what is made out of. Okay, He laid his life on the cross and he made himself of no reputation and allowed himself to be an object of shame on that cross. He allowed himself to be an object of shame on that cross. But on that same cross, he conquered death, beloved. And just like the scripture said, he rose from the dead after three days. He is seated at the right hand of the majesty of God on high, given a name which is above every other name. And one day, like I said, he will come back to earth with all his glory to be indeed, be the king of kings and lord of lords. In the fullness of time, he came to be born in a way totally different from what we would have expected with a message of redemption and adoption, he became man, the son of man, the Emmanuel, the God with us. This is the Christ of Christmas. Let it be no other message for us this Christmas time than the God with us, Emmanuel. Let me ask you, this man, this God-man, this incarnate man, this Emmanuel, this God with us who have been, we've been talking about for the last four Sundays. Beloved, let me ask you, is he really your God? Is he really your king? Is he really preeminent? And as the year comes to a close, I ask myself, as I want to ask you as your pastor, is your loyalty, is your adoration, is your worship of the Son of God? Or is it someone else? Or something else? As we go home today and celebrate with family and friends, May I encourage us all, make Jesus Christ indeed the King, indeed the King of our life. Let's pray. Father, thank you once again for the opportunity and the privilege to preach your word. Help us not get tired of listening to that message on the cross. Lord, at this Christmas time, while we celebrate and enjoy uh, the freedom we have because of the liberation we have in Jesus Christ, oh God, may we not forget the giver of the gift. And so, Father, we thank you. We praise you for indeed back in the Garden of Eden, he started communicating to us, seeking man. Where art thou, you say? And, oh, Father, I pray that during this Christmas time, indeed, the Lord Jesus be the very center and forefront of our celebrations. We give you thanks for the wonder that you are. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.